Hi all, Retro Tech Chris here again. Recently, I picked up a machine that I've been looking to add to my collection for quite some time, a Pentium Pro. I happened to serendipitously find this at the VCF Mid-Atlantic Spring Swap Meet, which I attended in late February. And here you can see some initial pictures of the machine that I took and posted on Twitter. And you can see that very nice motherboard there, this TD6NF that we'll talk about a little bit later. Now this board did need some work done to it. It had a dead Dallas clock chip as well as a blown PS2 keyboard fuse. And well, that IO shield that you see in the bottom right, while it is a thing of beauty, maybe there's something we can do about that as well. And while at the swap meet, I also picked up some other items that you can see on the table here. Perhaps we'll have a look at some of those in a future video. But today's focus is this nice 200 megahertz dual Pentium Pro system. And you can see I paid a whopping $15 for it. What a deal. And the reason I wanted a Pentium Pro was to fill a hole in my collection. As we look at my nice infograph here, we can see that there is now Pentium Pro present on the infograph, and prior to this purchase, it was not present. And perhaps in a future video, we'll have a closer look at this nice infograph here. Let's have a look at the hardware. I'll go ahead and get the case popped open here. In the meantime, you can admire the nice IO shield as we saw earlier, as well as the various port expansions at the bottom. And here you can see the inside of the machine. We'll go ahead and start taking out components so that we can take that motherboard out. We'll start with this nice S3 card that we see here. It's a Trio 64V+. And next we'll pull out the Ethernet card, which happens to be a 3Com card. Nice enough to get the job done, as we'll see here in just a minute. I absolutely love these cards, and I love the concept of that parallel tasking that you see there as well. And next I'll go ahead and try to take out this USB expansion. However, I'm going to struggle a little bit because the header actually connects underneath the power supply. But we can have a brief look at that. And then from there, let's go ahead and pull that power supply so we can take the rest of that out, <laughs> as well as take out other components and pull that motherboard out. So here you can see me getting the power supply out. And from there, we'll go ahead and shift angles here. And we can go ahead and pull out that USB header now that is free, as well as disconnecting the power supply and the various cables associated with it. This fan that connects via the power supply is a little bit of a pain to get undone, but we will prevail and get that unattached as well, at which point we can pull the power supply out. Perfect. So next we'll pull the switches and LEDs as well as the screws so that we can take the motherboard out. So you can see me disassembling here just a little bit and I'll take out that two gigabyte hard drive as well. And then we can pull the motherboard out. Perfect. So now that the board is out of the system, we can have a closer look and we can see this is a TD6NF board and it does have two 200 megahertz Pentium Pro processors on it. So that's about as high as we can go with this board. We can see that there are various options for IO options and we can see a nice picture or diagram of the motherboard here nicely labeled as well. Next, let's have a look at some of the repairs that need done. We'll start with this Dallas chip you see here. It has a dead battery and it is soldered to the board. We will be replacing it with a Glitchworks chip that you see here. And also these two PS2 fuses, one of them is burned out, but both of them will be replaced with these fuses you see here with a little help from the Obsolete Geek. Now let's take a look at the massive fan and heatsink and CPU that is the Pentium Pro. We'll pop that off, revealing the Pentium Pro below. These ZIF sockets are a little bit hard to lift up. It takes a little bit of pressure to get them out due to the massive size of these CPUs. There you can see the bottom markings on the CPU itself, and they are both identical. We'll go ahead and put that back in the slot here before anything bad happens to it. So another issue I ran into on this machine was failing memory. Here you can see a successful mem test, and it occurred after I pulled this bad chip out. Let's label it so that we don't mistake it for a good chip later. So the next thing I decided to address is this lovely IO shield. As nice as it is, it needs to go. 
So what I decided to do was take my first foray into 3D design, and I think this turned out pretty good. In any case, you can definitely see there is a gap between the I.O. ports and the rest of the bracket, but for purposes of this PC, I think we're going to be okay. You can see on the left there we have our serial, PS2 ports, parallel, another serial port, then we have our USB headers, video, Ethernet, and a Sound Blaster AWE64 for good measure. I also put a 6x DVD drive into this machine, and you can see the front of the machine here in all of its glory. It's not the prettiest of systems, but it definitely gets the job done and does exactly what I want it to do. On power up, we're greeted with an S3 screen for the video card, followed by a BIOS splash screen. We can see the memory counting up in real time, the TD6NF designation on the upper left for the motherboard model, an Energy Star logo on the far right, and after this memory finishes counting up, we will see the master and slave drives detected, and also information screen. This machine has WinBIOS. We can go in and look at the primary master settings as you see me doing here, and I will take you on a tour of the various WinBIOS options. Next, we can look at the date and time where we can change the year if we want or do whatever we'd like, all graphically, very primitive, but it's cool to see on this generation of machine. We can also change the floppy drives if we so desire, and we can also have a look at advanced features where we can change things like the boot up sequence, primary display, and things of that nature all selectable here in this graphical BIOS. We also have a chipset section where we configure memory timings and various other performance settings, memory hole, other items as well to increase the performance of the system. Then we have power management, which is currently disabled. It's your standard power management settings. We can go to PCI and PNP settings and see I don't have this configured for a plug and play OS. But we can change other settings like your DMA channels and IRQs, all selectable from this particular screen that you see here. Next we have peripheral settings, and I didn't change anything here, though I should really change that parallel port mode to be something a little faster than normal mode. We can also go to the security section and change the supervisor password, either by typing or clicking, and we can enable antivirus. Under the utility section, we have the ability to detect an IDE drive, as you see me doing here. Very nice. We can also look at the language settings, though there is only one language available, unfortunately. Next, we can look at the help via Alt-H and see the various options that we have as well for selecting different options. So you can use the keyboard if desired. We can click that little yellow minus sign and then we can exit. Next up, we're going to install some operating systems that support multiple processors. We'll start with Red Hat Linux 6.2. No, this is not Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. This is Red Hat Linux 6.2. So you can see me selecting various configuration options. We'll set up our network. We'll set up our root password. And then we can go ahead and install the packages, which takes 18 minutes to set up. Not too bad. From there, we can skip the boot disk creation and do our first boot, which starts up in a rather speedy 1 minute and 35 seconds, which is not too terribly bad. So pretty impressive there for a startup time. We can log in and here we have our nice graphical interface. And I'll go ahead and launch a web browser here and we'll switch to real time to show the browsing speed. We can go to Google and we can see this loads up reasonably well for an old Netscape communicator browser. Next, let's have a look at processor information as seen under Linux. And as we look at the CPU info, we can see there are two processors detected, both Pentium Pros, of course, since they are identical. And these systems are a 200 megahertz speed with 256 kilobytes of cache. Next, let's load Windows 2000. An installation here takes a whopping 47 minutes, not fast by any stretch of the imagination. But boot time is a respectable 1 minute and 30 seconds, not too bad. And now that we're booted up here, let's go have a look at the device manager. So I'll flip over to properties and then hardware and device manager. 
And what we can see is if we expand computer, we will see we have a SMP or an MPS system, multiprocessor PC. We can click on that and look at the driver for it. Kind of fun to see this in Windows 2000. Now let's have some fun and load a game. I'm going to load Pinball. So we can go up here to Accessories and Games and we'll find Pinball. And I'm loading this in real time. We can see it's a little bit slow, but I recall Pinball taking some time to load on pretty much any machine. And before too terribly long, it will be loaded and things will start to happen and we can start game play. So let's go ahead and let's get that ball fired off here. And what we will see is that it does play pretty smoothly. Not bad for this S3 video card that we have in the system and this dual Pentium Pro system. Not bad at all. Next, let's load up frogfind.com using Internet Explorer. We can go ahead and search for, I don't know, how about Pentium Pro? And we can enter that search and we can say yes to confirm and we will see some nice articles pop up on the Pentium Pro. Next, let's install Windows NT 4.0 Workstation. And this installs in an impressive 15 minutes. This is more of what I would expect. And this is a great operating system to pair with this system. And the startup time is an impressive 1 minute and 22 seconds. And I love how it shows two system processors. And once the startup process completes, we can go ahead and launch the start menu and we can browse around a little bit. So the first thing I'll do is just load up WordPad. And what I'm seeing is that the start menu and everything is very nice and responsive. Indeed, this machine was designed for an operating system like this. From there, we can try and browse the web, but well, it doesn't quite work out so well. And we can see why pretty quickly. We're actually using Internet Explorer 2.0, which is a little bit too old to be browsing the web these days. Next, let's make some performance observations. So the system, once again, is a 200 megahertz Pentium Pro. As we look at the caches, this machine does have 256K of level two cache, an i44FX based motherboard, as well as 192 megabytes of video memory. As for the SPD settings, we're not controlling them at this time. Graphics is that S3 Trio card that we talked about. And now let's look at some benchmarks. I'm first going to compare this to an Intel Pentium 133, and we can see it is indeed faster, quite a bit in fact. Next we can compare it to an MMX 200, and there's pretty much parity in this case. And next we can compare it to a Cyrex GX1300, and that's all I'll say about that. But wait a minute, this is an SMP dual core system. We should really use a utility that can do comparisons more in line with a dual core system. And I found this utility even though it said don't run on slower systems. Here you can see the task manager with both CPUs pegged as I have the utility set to run two tasks at full speed. We can bump it down to one task and we'll see the CPU history drop off and now only about 52% of the CPU is used as opposed to 100 as one would expect when running only one full-time task. Next, let's look at some sign calculations. And with only one task running, we get about 142 of them in any given time frame. And with two, we get double. So that's pretty good, actually. Now, if I bump this up to three, we're going to see that things bounce around a bit because now we are context switching. Whereas when we ran two tasks, we were not. So we get some variability. Next, we'll have a look at memory writes. And we'll start with one task and see we get 64 megabytes per second. If we switch to two, it actually is the same. So memory writes, no improvement. Next, we'll look at memory reads. With one task, we get 52 megabytes per second. And with two, we get 96. So not quite double, but that's not too bad, all things considered. In any event, that's a tour of my new Intel Pentium Pro dual processor system in about 15 minutes or less. A special thanks to the Obsolete Geek, who was very helpful with the board level repairs. Very exciting to have this board operational, and I'm very glad to have this machine in my collection. In all cases, I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.